Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Worship at First Baptist Dallas today. We welcome guests, high campus viewers across the world. Church, let's stand together. We're going to join our voices, our hearts, and this hymn of faith to God. Be the glory. To God be the glory.
Wonderful worship, you may be seated. Well, we do welcome each and every one of you this morning for worship here at First Baptist Dallas. And if you're a guest joining us, we're so glad that you're here. And we do have a very special gift bundle just for you today. It includes our pastor's brand new book, 18 Minutes with Jesus, Straight Talk from the Savior about the things that matter most. And guess we've also included for you a great CD from our choir and orchestra. As you came in this morning, you received a worship guide, and you're going to find enclosed this welcome card. Guests, please take the time to fill this out. You can also scan the QR code and keep the card with you. At the conclusion of the service, take your completed card with you. Right outside these main worship center doors, you're going to find our welcome center. Our staff is waiting there for you. You'll exchange your completed card for your gift today, and we'll be happy to answer any questions you have about our church. We look forward to meeting you. Now, guests, if you can't make it to the Welcome Center, we do have some boxes on your way out. You can simply place your card in one of those boxes, and we'll mail you a copy of your gift. And then if you're joining us on iCampus, just follow that link provided on the bottom of your screen. You can access your welcome gift that way. Well, again, welcome each and every one of you for a special morning of worship. We have so many exciting events taking place here at First Dallas. Let's take a moment now and look together at the screen. Good morning, and welcome to worship. I'm excited to share some upcoming events for you and your family this summer. Kids who have completed second through sixth grade, join us for an unforgettable adventure at Kids Camp at Carolina Creek. Children will have fun participating in Bible studies, worship, and exciting recreation. Students, travel with us to Orange Beach, Alabama from June 12th through the 16th. Beach Camp will be an unforgettable week to worship alongside CBC Worship. Enjoy the beach with friends and learn the keys to a Christian life from Dr. Ed Newton. Church, our pastor is beginning a brand new series on June 18th titled, Say Goodbye to Regret. This series is about turning those if-onlys into valuable life lessons through God's grace and forgiveness. All are invited to join us for Freedom Sunday on June 25th. We will celebrate our freedom as Americans and our freedom in Christ with fireworks and patriotic worship. We will welcome guests, Grammy Award winning artist Guy Penrod and U.S. Senator James Langford to our service. For more information on everything happening at our church, visit firstdallas.org slash events. You know, these camps in the life of our church are so important. How many of you made a commitment or heard God's voice for direction at a camp, in a summer camp? Many of you doing that. I did too, my hands up. Of course, I'd go just for that gospel slip and slide they had, you know? (laughs) We hope you'll take part in these great activities. Let's read God's Word together. Colossians 3, verses 8 through 11 will be the text we'll be reading this morning. And uh, it will help us set us up for the message of the pastor. We're in the home stretch on his series on the Ten Commandments. We'll read from the New American Standard Bible, and you'll see those words on the screen here in the worship center and also on iCampus as well. You'll have those words so that we can all read God's Word together. Join me in standing, if you will, as we honor the reading of God's Word. Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 8, and we'll end with verse 11. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him." a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free man. But Christ is all 
and in all. May God richly bless the reading of his word. Keep standing now as we continue our time of worship together. Well, church, it's a great day because Dr. Leo Day is back in the house. He's coming to lead us in one of our favorites, Break Every Chain. Let's welcome him. Let's sing together, church. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain. 
Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Dr. Ron Harris comes back to lead us in our offertory prayer. This is such a high and holy time when we have the privilege of dedicating our tithes and offerings to the Lord. And we uh, come to this time really as an act of worship. God has blessed us so much individually and as a church. It's our opportunity to give back to the Lord. You can lower the kneelers on this main area, and as you're able to kneel, let's bow before God. Heavenly Father, it is a privilege to be in your house. We live in a world, Lord, that we don't have to look too far beyond the headlines of the news stories to know it is a sin-sick world that desperately needs the hope found only in Jesus Christ. Thank you for a church that is built upon that hope, that truth upon your word, and a church that also sends out that message to the world that many may come to know Jesus as Lord, and all of us will grow in our faith and be strengthened in our daily walk. Thank you, Lord, for giving us so much. As we come to this time to dedicate really your tithes and our offerings, we ask, Lord, that you will multiply and bless them in ways that go far beyond our own imagination. We thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice of Christ on the cross that gives us that eternal hope. And we pray our prayer in the saving name of Jesus. Amen.
Thank you so much, Dr. Leo Day and great First Baptist Dallas Choir and Orchestra for your music today. Politicians lie. <laughs> now, they'll never admit to it. The most they will ever concede is to what Winston Churchill once called terminological inexactitude. <laughs> but it's a lie any way you look at it. But, of course, that's not news to you. The question today is not do politicians lie, but do you lie? Now, before you protest and say, oh, no, pastor, not guilty of that one, I want to invite you to hook yourself up this morning to a mental lie detector. Take the cuff, put it on your right arm, make sure it's firmly secure. I have a few questions I want to ask you this morning. Number one, do you have a secret life you don't want others to discover? Would you agree to answer any question your spouse asked you if you were hooked up to an actual lie detector? Do you often say things you don't mean for the sake of politeness? Have you ever lied about your age, education, or income? Would you tell a close friend that he or she had bad breath? Don't look at your neighbor on that one. <laughs> Number six, have you ever said, I love you, without meaning it? Number seven, do you really love and respect your in-laws? Number eight, did you lie on this test? <laughs> if we're honest, most of us have engaged in terminological inexactitude or breaking what we know as the Ninth Commandment. It's found in Exodus 20, 16. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now, as we're going to see in just a moment, this commandment involves a certain kind of lying. But let me just say something about this commandment in general. It's related to the sixth, seventh, and eighth commandment. It involves taking something that doesn't belong to you. The sixth commandment, don't take your neighbor's life. The seventh commandment, don't take your neighbor's wife or husband. The eighth commandment we looked at last time, don't take your neighbor's goods. And this commandment, don't take your neighbor's good name. That's what lying is all about, as we'll see in a moment. But before we get into this specific kind of lying, I want to talk about deception in general. You know, we live in an age in which deception is expected and rationalized. Uh, I think about the father who was taking his six-year-old son to the movie. Uh, the theater allowed children under the age of six to get in for free, and so the ticket taker looked at the boy and said, how old are you? And obeying his father's instruction, he said, I'm five. And the ticket taker looked at him and said, and when are you going to turn six? He said, as soon as the movie is over. <laughs> now, the little boy didn't feel comfortable lying about that, but he did it because he was instructed to. Children don't like lying for their parents. God's not keen on the idea either. If you want to get an idea of how serious God treats the subject of lying, just look at Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 to 19. There are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven, which are an abomination to Him. Now, that ought to catch our attention right off the, uh, out of the gate. Seven things God hates. We ought to perk up to that. What are the things God hates the most? Verse 17, haughty eyes, that is pride, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. What's interesting is, out of this list of seven sins, two of them have to do with the subject of lying. If you want to see how much God hates lying, look in the New Testament at Acts chapter 5. Do you remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira? The very first sin God judged in the newly birthed church, the very first sin was not murder, blasphemy, or adultery. It was lying. 
Remember Ananias and Sapphira lied to the church about money they had supposedly given to the church, but they actually had kept back the portion of a land sale? What did Peter say in Acts 5, verse 3? He said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it remain? Did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, it wasn't, was it not under your control? Why is it that you've conceived this deed in your heart? You've not lied to men, but to God. And as Ananias heard these words, Ananias fell down and he breathed his last. And here's the greatest understatement in the Bible, and great fear came upon all who heard of it. I've always said Peter missed a great opportunity. He could have passed the offering plate right then and taken up the largest offering in the history of the church, but he didn't do that. But the people got the message, God hates liars and he hates lying. Now, some people always point out, well, wait a minute, if God hates lying, what about Rahab, the prostitute? Here she is mentioned in Hebrews 11 as a great woman of faith, but she lied. Remember the story? She was a prostitute living in Jericho. God had said he was going to defeat uh, Jericho and give it to the Israelites. And Joshua sent spies into Jericho to see what obstacles they faced. And Rahab hid those spies. And when the king of Jericho uh, sent word to her saying, we hear reports that you are harboring spies, she said, oh, no, they've already left, even though she was keeping them. So why does God honor her? Well, of course, God didn't praise Rahab for her lying. He praised her because of her faith in believing that God would do what he had promised to do with Jericho. God absolutely hates lying. Why does he hate it so much? Well, one reason is because of the origin of lying. Where does lying come from? It doesn't originate with God. In James 1.17, James, the half-brother of Jesus, writes, Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, that is God. And notice this descriptor, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. We talk today about people who shade the truth. There's no such thing as shading the truth. There is no shading with God. He is the Father of light. There's no variation, no shadow. Why does God hate lying? Because of the origin of lying. Lying does not originate with God. Do you remember as a child being tricked into that question? <laughs> People would ask, can God do anything? And then you would say, oh yes, God can do anything. Then the questioner would say, well, if God can do anything, can he make a rock so heavy he can't lift it? Did you ever fall for that? I did all the time. And you can get into a big discussion of what God can and can't do. But here's one thing God can't do. Titus 1 verse 2 says, God cannot lie. It is absolutely impossible for God to lie. He is truth, absolute truth. God cannot lie. On the other hand, Satan cannot not lie. He is the father of lies. That's what Jesus said in John 8, 44. Satan does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar, and he is the father of all lies. Here's why God hates lying so much. When we engage in lying, we are acting more like Satan than we are acting like God. We are acting more like children of the devil than children of the most holy one. J.I. Packer, the theologian, wrote, there can be no godliness without truthfulness. Listen to Hebrew, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 22. Paul says, lay aside the old self which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of the deceit and put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, having been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Paul is talking about, he's using the imagery of a corpse. 
Uh, in Jesus' day, in Paul's day, remember when a corpse was buried or put in a sepulcher? It was wrapped in grave clothes. Grave clothes are great for a corpse, for somebody who's dead, but nobody who's alive wants to walk around in grave clothes. What Paul is saying is, you're a new person in Christ. You've died to your old way of living. Lay aside those old, stinking grave clothes that are fitting for a corpse, and instead put on new clothes that are in keeping with who you are in Christ. In verse 25, he says, therefore, lay aside, which grave clothes? Lay aside falsehood. Speak truth instead, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. God hates lying, first of all, because of the origin of lying. It comes from Satan, not from God. Here's a second reason God hates it, because of the outcome of lying. Look at Proverbs 6, verse 19, that list again of the seven things God hates the most. Notice how it culminates, climaxes. Verse 19, God hates a false witness who utters lies and who spreads strife among brothers. There is a relationship between lying and spreading strife among brothers. Uh, the King James talks about those who sow discord among the brethren. I used to have a deacon in my first church who got it wrong all the time. He talked about sowing discourse among the brethren. But we all knew what he meant. God hated people who divided by their speech other people. Now, let me be real clear here. There are some people we ought to be divided from. We don't want unity with everybody. The world wants unity with everybody. God doesn't want everybody to be unified. How do I know that? Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 to 36. Jesus said, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace on earth. When's the last time you saw that on a Christmas card? That's what he said. Look it up, Matthew 10, 34 to 36. I didn't come to bring peace on the earth. I came to bring a sword. What is that sword? Is God's Word. Jesus is the living Word of God. He came and he divided people according to whether they accepted the truth or rejected the truth. We live in a world that wants to throw away truth. We all want to be united and tolerate one another. I had a reporter from the Associated Press uh, call me Friday and say, Pastor, what do you think of these pride events that celebrate the LGBTQ community? I said, we should not be celebrating what God has condemned. We should not be taking pride in doing those things that are an abomination to God. Let's be clear, God created sex, Jesus said in Matthew 19, to be between one man and one woman in a marriage relationship. And any deviation from that, whether it's transgenderism, homosexuality, adultery, any deviation from that is something that needs to be repented of, not to find pride in whatsoever. So this idea that we're all supposed to be unified, no, truth, God's truth divides people. But what God does hate is those things, lies, that cause discord, strife, division among brethren, among those who are part of the family of God. Let me just ask you a question. Think about any serious division or break you had with another Christian. Maybe it's the loss of a marriage. Maybe it's the loss of an important friendship. I bet somewhere in that breakup was a lie or a deception that occurred. That's why God hates lying. It causes a false division among people. Well, again, it's easy to say, well, I don't lie. But just as there's more than one way to commit adultery, one, the, more than one way to steal from a person, there are different ways that we lie. Let me mention four of them. First of all, we lie when we're involved in contradicting the truth. That is opposing the truth, saying something that is completely contrary to truth. You see that in the garden. 
Remember in Genesis 2, 16 to 17, the Lord God commanded the man saying, of any of the trees of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat, you will surely die. And then in Genesis 3, that serpent and the manifestation of Satan slithers up to the woman. And what does he say to her in Genesis 3, 4? You shall not surely die. A complete contradiction of what God said. That's one way we lie, when we contradict what we know to be the truth. We have a lot of reasons for lying, for contradicting the truth. Sometimes we do it to seek revenge on people we don't like. Sometimes we do it to try to spare them from being hurt. Sometimes we lie to impress other people. Sometimes we just lie out of convenience. It's easier to lie than to tell the truth. Years ago, I was preaching on this topic and talking about the different ways we uh, lie. Uh, and uh, on the way home from church, my girls were uh, little girls at that time, and I was talking about trying to impress upon them the different ways we lie. And uh, one of them spoke up. I'll keep her name to myself. But she said, oh, Dad, is that like when somebody calls our house and you tell Mom to say you're not at home? Uh, <laughs> but enough about me. <laughs> That's one way we lie, by contradicting the truth. But sometimes, secondly, we engage in twisting the truth. We're not technically lying, but the intention is the same, to deceive somebody. Calvin Miller writes about the time that he was in seminary, and uh, he was uh, keeping a part-time job at a factory in order to earn money, and one uh, night, he realized he couldn't go in to work. He needed to study for an exam, but he knew his employer wouldn't find that a successful excuse. So he asked his wife what they were having for dinner. She said, frozen fish. He said, fine. And he went down and laid down on the bed, flat on his back. He asked his wife to bring the package of frozen fish to him. He took the fish. He threw it up in the air. He caught it again. And then he told his wife, now go call my employer and tell her I'm flat on my back and I just threw up my dinner. <laughs> now, technically that was true, but it was a lie. He was trying to twist the truth for his own convenience. A third way we engage in lying is when we neglect the truth. That is, we hear a lie, we know the truth, but we keep silent. Go back to Ephesians 4, 25 for a moment. Lay aside falsehood and instead speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. It is wrong to keep silent when we know the truth. In fact, that was part of the Old Testament law. In Leviticus 5, verse 1, Moses wrote, if you are called to testify about something you have seen or that you know about, it is sinful to refuse to testify, and you will be punished for your sin. I remember talking to a friend of mine, and we were talking about a staff member from another church that had suddenly left. And my friend said, oh, I heard that it was because of immorality. And I happened to have some information. I said, well, actually, I know about that situation, and no immorality was involved at all. That's not why he left. Now, my friend could have just kept that information to himself, said, oh, okay, no big deal. But instead, he felt compelled to go back and call the person who had told him that and said, I've got information that what you're saying is not true, and I need to share that with you. Why did he do that? He understood the principle that we are supposed to speak truth to correct falsehoods that we know to be false. When we neglect to share the truth, we're guilty of deception. A fourth way we lie is through uh, inflating the truth. Inflating the truth, trying to make a good story better by inflating it a little bit. Uh, two pastors were at a preaching convention, and uh, during one of the breaks, one asked the other one, how many are you running in your worship service? And the other pastor said, between four and 500. And the pastor said, well, that's great. He went home. That week later in the week, he received in the mail that church's bulletin. And he happened to notice the attendance. It was 87. He called his friend, pastor friend, said, you told me you ran between 
four and 500, and here your attendance is 87. What's going on? He said, well, 87 is between four and 500. <laughs> That's called inflating the truth. Again, before you say that you don't do that, have you ever inflated the truth on a resume? About your educational experience? About your work experience? Have you ever made something sound better than it is? Have you ever claimed to be closer to somebody? Oh, they're a great friend of mine. Closer relationship than you really enjoy with that other person. We use that in arguments with people. We inflate the truth. Somebody gets in an argument with their spouse and they say, you have never told me you love me, not once. Really? Never? In 20, 30, 40 years? Maybe that's true. Many times it's not true. Or you just always blow up whenever you get bad news. Is that true? Every time you've received a pass, uh, bad news, your mate has blown up and exploded. We exaggerate, again, to win a point in an argument. Now, some of you are thinking, Pastor, you're being awfully nitpicky here. I mean, after all, we're from Texas. We're known for embellishing. That's just part of who we are. What's the big deal with embellishing the truth or twisting the truth or neglecting the truth? Years ago, I remember telling a personal story from the pulpit, and I will admit it sounded far-fetched. I, I agree, but it was absolutely true. Later, I heard a little boy ask his dad at lunch, is what Pastor Jeffers said today, do you think that really happened to him? And the father said, no, that's just preacher talk. And you know, when that got back to me, I thought, if that little boy thinks I'm not telling the truth about that experience, how, did he, how does he know I'm telling the truth about anything? When I talk about Jesus, when I talk about salvation, when I talk about heaven or hell, how does he know I'm not just engaged in preacher talk? The same is true for you and me. As mouthpieces for God in this world, we need to be known. We need to have credibility for always telling the truth. That's why James 5.12 says, But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be your yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment." Now, is this passage saying you're never supposed to take an oath in court or put your hand on the Bible? That's not what this verse is about. What this verse is saying is be known as a person of credibility so much that you don't even have to swear to something. If you say something, people automatically believe you because of your track record for telling the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. As sons and daughters of God, we are to be known for telling the truth. Now, we've talked about the general concept of lying and deceiving. But notice God zeroes in on one special kind of lying in the ninth commandment. Again, look at Exodus 20, 16. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You're not supposed to do something that bears false witness, say something that is false about your neighbor. Why does he zero in on this kind of lying? Two reasons. First of all, bearing false witness perverts justice. It perverts justice. Now, stay with me on this. Remember, Israel was a theocracy. That means these commandments were not just given for somebody's personal relationship with God. These were the laws by which the nation of Israel was governed. And that means people who broke the laws had a civil punishment that was meted out to them. And the commandments about adultery or murder, or, uh, adultery or murder the punishment was capital punishment. They would lose their life. And so, God was ensuring that the justice system remained just by insisting that we not lie about somebody, especially in a capital case. In Exodus 23, there's a whole list of things about making sure you don't succumb to the temptation or the pressure to call a guilty man innocent 
or to call an innocent man guilty. How did they ensure that didn't happen? Well, there were two procedures. In Deuteronomy 17, verse 6, first of all, God said, on the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses, he, is, he who is to die shall be put to death. He shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. No single witness was enough to convict somebody of a capital crime. It was very important that people told the truth. But to ensure the truth was being told, they said, we're not going to accept one witness. There has to be two or three witnesses to an event before we take somebody's life from them. By the way, the Apostle Paul picked up on that in 1 Timothy 5, 19, when he said, do not accept an accusation against an elder or a pastor, except on the basis of two or three eyewitnesses. It's a serious thing to accuse somebody of something that is going to cause them to lose their life or even their reputation. So make sure there are two or three witnesses. Now, I know that's politically incorrect to say today. We're supposed to say the accuser is always right, always believe the accuser. God says, no, don't always believe the accuser. Make sure there are some eyewitnesses who corroborate what is being accused. So, the first protection was to make sure there are two or three witnesses. And then look at Deuteronomy 17, verse 7. The hand of the witnesses shall be first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people. If you're going to take somebody's life from them, you're going to accuse them of something. Not only did they have to be multiple witnesses, but those witnesses, those two or three, were the first ones to throw the first stones to execute a person. In other words, God said, you better make sure that what you're telling is the truth because you're going to be the first one to throw the first stone. And if you're lying, you're guilty not only of lying, you're guilty of murder as well. So, Truth-telling was important, first of all, to keep justice from being perverted. But secondly, bearing false witness robs a person of their reputation. It robs a person of their reputation. Listen to Colossians 3, verse 8. We read it this morning. But now you also put them all aside. Here are the grave clothes you're to put aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander and abusive speech from your mouth. Underline that word slander. The only way to understand what the Bible means by slander is by looking at the first cousin of slander, which is gossip. The Bible talks about gossip. Proverbs 18 verse 8 says, the words of a talebearer are like dainty morsels. They go down into the innermost parts of a body. That word gossip in Greek, Sisterus, sisterus. It's what we call in English an onomatopoeia. It sounds like what it's describing. Sisterus. That's gossip. Just privately sharing hurtful or harmful information about another person. That's gossip. But what's talked about in verse 8 is slander. Slander means to strike out against. The person who slanders another person doesn't even try to hide what he's saying. He is so intent on destroying another person, he speaks as loudly as he can to as many people as he can, sharing harmful information about another person. What's the problem with slander? It requires us to make judgments about people we're not capable of making. In James 4, 11 and 12, listen to what James writes. Do not speak against one another, brethren. That is, slander one another. For he who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who's able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? What James is saying is when you slander somebody, you're basically serving as judge, jury, and executioner of that person's reputation. You're required to make judgments you're not capable of making, and that's why we're not to do it. You see, the problem with words, especially slander and gossip, is 
They can never be taken back. Harmful words can never be retrieved. Do you remember a man named Raymond Donovan? Back in the 1980s, he was the Secretary of Labor under President Reagan. And he was accused of misdeeds, of fraud, and other crimes. He lost his post, but later on he was acquitted of any crime and wrongdoing. And I remember watching the press conference with him, Raymond Donovan, and somebody said, Mr. Donovan, what are you going to do now? He said, does anybody know what office I go to to get my reputation back? There is no such office. Because once a name has been slandered, it can never be restored completely. You know, when you think about it, our name, our good name, is really all that we have. Solomon said in Proverbs 22, verse 1, a good name is to be more desired than great wealth. Favor is better than silver and gold. Each of us lives and dies without our name. It's the only one we get. And that's why we need to be very careful in protecting the re reputation of other people by refusing to bear false witness against our neighbors. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. I've been talking to Christians this morning, but I know there's some people watching, listening here, here in day one, who have not yet become a Christian yet. I want to go back to Satan for just a moment. Jesus said he is a liar. He is the father of all lies. Perhaps Satan is deceiving you right now by whispering lies into your ear. Lies like, this life is all that there is. There is no heaven. There is no hell. When Jesus said, there are both. Some will be raised to eternal blessing. Others will be raised to eternal destruction. Satan says, well, even if there is a hell, you're not bad enough to go there. You're good enough to get into heaven. You don't need all of this forgiveness stuff, this grace stuff. You're a pretty good person. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. There is only one way to escape God's judgment in your life, and it's by trusting, believing, and clinging to Jesus Christ to be your Savior. And today, if you would like to receive God's unconditional gift of forgiveness, wherever you are, I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me, knowing that God's listening to you. Would you pray this with me? Dear God, thank you for loving me. I know I have failed you in so many ways, and I'm truly sorry for the sins in my life. But I believe what I've heard today, that you loved me so much, you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me, to take the punishment I deserve to take for my sins. And right now, I'm trusting in what Jesus did for me, not in my good works, but in what Jesus did for me to save me from my sins. Thank you for forgiving me and help me to live the rest of my life for you. In Jesus' name, amen. For those of you watching online, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, go to the top of your screen, click on the link that says, I prayed the prayer to trust in Christ. As soon as you do that, I'll be notified of your decision. I have some free material I'll send you this week on what it means now to live as a Christian. Don't wait another moment. Click on the top of that link now. For those of you in day one and in our worship service, if you would take out the card that is in your bulletin, and you'll notice there's a place for you to check to indicate if you prayed that prayer. Let us know, and we'll send that same online material to you this week. If you're a guest, please let us know by checking that box. Maybe today you'd like to join First Baptist Dallas. It's never been easier to do so than now. You can check that third box, and we'll contact you this week about your decision. Now, when you've finished your card, on the way out, drop by the Welcome Center and we'll exchange your card for a copy of the book, 18 Minutes with Jesus, and the Choir and Orchestra CD. We also have what we call decision counselors 
who are available at the Welcome Center to pray with you about any special need you have in your life, answer any questions you have about our church. So thank you for doing that. By the way, on the way out too on the concourse, you see a display from our Ethics and Religious Liberties uh, Committee. They inform us of special events, special legislation that Christians need to be aware of, special stands that we need to take, not on political grounds, but on biblical grounds. Stop by that uh, uh, table and you'll pick up some very helpful information. Well, today we've got an extra treat. I finished a little early today so we could participate in this. You know, we have such a wonderful children's and youth ministry here that grounds our students and children in the truth of God's Word and how to use the Bible skillfully for every area of life. So I want to recognize, there she is, she appeared out of nowhere, Shelly Taylor, our children's minister, to tell us what we're doing here, Shelly. Thank you, Pastor. We are so excited to share with you today. The students that we have coming out on stage are part of our first Baptist Dallas Bible Drill program. We also have two of our leaders who are going to be assisting us, Keith Fallhaber and Lauren Horton. We have four levels of Bible drill, our children's division, fourth through sixth grade, our youth, seventh through ninth, high school, 10th through 12th, and our speakers, which is also 10th through 12th. Bible drill is a competitive program that teaches scripture memorization and Bible skills. All of our drillers must learn how to locate any book in the Bible quickly. Pastor, would you like to test them on this skill? I will. We're going to do three of them here. First of all, we're going to have you name a book of the Bible so, and find it. I'm going to name the book of the Bible. When I say start, you'll locate the book, place an index finger on any page of that book, and then step forward. And when called upon, You'll give the name of the book preceding the called name, the name of the called book, and the book that follows the one called. All right, I'm told you can do this quickly. So, attention, present Bibles. Isaiah, you've got 10 seconds, start. I'm not about to attempt to call which one got there first. We have, we have Morgan. All right, Morgan, tell us. Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Song of Solomon, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. Does anybody know if that's true or not? No, that is true. Very nice. Let's give Morgan a round of applause there. That's great. All right, another type of draw we're going to do here. We're going to locate a key passage in the Bible, like the Lord's Supper or the Sermon on the Mount or a Psalm of Praise. So we're going to look at this key passage. I bet you're not surprised at this. The key passage is going to be the Ten Commandments. Start. It looks like we've got multiple winners here, but who's going to call this one? Pastor, this is Femi. The Ten Commandments, Exodus 23 through 17. Femi, Very you good. Read, would you read verse 12 for us, please? Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, verse 12. That is great. <laughs> Students also learn to answer questions about their faith and steps to salvation. In our last example, we only quote a part of the verse, and the drillers must recognize the source of that verse and locate it. Pastor, would you like to check one of their salvation verses? Absolutely. I, I forgot to say attention last time. <laughs> attention, present Bibles, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Start. Start. 
All right, who's going to get the honor? Pastor, this is Anna. Hey, Anna. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Matthew 7, 21. Isn't that great? Thank you. At the state's finals this year, Lillian Felton won first place in the high school division. Andrew Wisely won second place. In the youth division, Grace Lajawami and Maddox Lemons tied for second, and Grady Felton won third place. In the speakers category, Hava Leche won second place. This year, our students received a total of $3,250 in scholarships. In our children's division, the following students each received a state winner perfect. Lola Atkinson, Joseph Brinkley, Vivian Felton, Alexis Maldonado, Edith Nakana, and Michelle Nakana. Of course, all of our students, all of our students are winners because they have all hidden God's word in their hearts. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Shelley, and thank you to all of our Bible drillers. They are perfect examples of what the Bible says, study to show yourself approved, a workman of God who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, as our students leave, our choir is going to come down, and we're going to do your Bible drill now. Uh, <laughs> and the staff will be next Sunday. <laughs> Isn't it good to be a part of a church that is training young men and women in the truth of Scripture, preparing them for life? Thank you, Shelly. Thank you for all of our volunteers who work with Bible Drill uh, every week. Well, thank you for being here today. Hope you have a great week in the Lord, and we'll look forward to seeing you next Sunday as we conclude the series on the Ten Commandments. Let's stand together as Tyler comes to lead us in our final song. Thank you, Pastor. What a wonderful morning of worship. Let's go out singing his praise. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Well, thank you so much for joining us for worship today on the First Dallas I campus. It's our honor and privilege to worship, chat, and pray with you throughout the service. If you are local to DFW, let me encourage you to come on down. We'd love to have you visit us in person. We'd love to greet uh, you and show you a great spot in the worship center for you to sit. Uh, it would be our honor to worship with you in person in the heart of downtown Dallas right here at First Baptist Dallas. Also, if you are new here to the iCampus or have been watching for a while and wanna get plugged in, let me encourage you to sign up for a free gift. We'd love to provide that to you directly in your inbox and then sign you up for Pastor's Daily Devotional. It's straight from the pen of Dr. Jeffress and you will be encouraged with that great resource each and every day. Simply visit the link that's provided on your screen. And lastly, stay connected with us each and every day with our Facebook Global Group. There we encourage one another through uh, scripture and graphics, but also pray for one another. So head on over to Facebook and join our iCampus Global Facebook Group. Thank you again for joining us today for worship. We look forward to seeing you next week on the First Dallas iCampus.